Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. It's been a long time since we have visited Matthew chapter 24, which is the topic that we've been dealing with. Um, I, being out sick with COVID was not the best time of my life, I guarantee you. I won't get into that today because we have a lot to talk about. There was something Jesus said that really captured my attention, and I think I'm going to deal with it, uh, and that is the subject of false prophets. Jesus warns us, Matthew 24, in verse 4, he said, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And then we're going to pick it up sort of where we left off the last time we dealt with persecution. Now, I sort of believe that, and, and you can see this going on in this world, you can see the rising tide of false Christianity, false doctrines, false Bibles, the vine of Sodom, and the bondage that the vine of Sodom brings people in. It gives them a false hope, a false security, a false temporary salvation. It's what it brings them. These are the children of bondage mentioned in Galatians chapter 4, where Paul was talking about Abraham and Sarah, Isaac being born the child of promise, the, the, the free child. And then he says, Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. Then he says that Hagar and Ishmael, born, Ishmael born in bondage. And he said, just as Hagar and Ishmael persecuted Sarah and Isaac, so do those who were born in bondage persecute those who were born free. That is precisely what happened. You see a rising tide of false Christianity. And when they look at, when they look at us and we say, well, we only believe the King James Bible. We only believe what that book says. People already are starting to persecute, calling us names, accusing us of idolatry. So you worship the Bible. I worship Jesus Christ and he is the word of God and he's perfect. Okay, so anyway, I think the two are tied together. Matthew 24, verse 11 is what I have on the screen. Jesus said, and many false prophets shall rise, many of them, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, that's talking about the rise of sin, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Are you, are you ready for that? Are you ready? Read the book of Acts. Read that book. It's a wonderful book. Luke, who wrote the book of Acts and the gospel of Luke, he describes what all happened with the church. You know, Jesus said, you know, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel. Then in, in the book of Acts, he tells them, you shall be witnesses unto me into, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. One, two, three, four, the gospel. And when he said that, they were there in Jerusalem. That's where the Holy Ghost came out. And 3,000 got saved, and all of a sudden the Lord's adding to the church daily such as, such as should be saved, and they're in Jerusalem. But they're not out in Judea yet. How did they get to Judea? They were persecuted in Jerusalem, and they left Jerusalem, and they went out into Judea. And they preached the gospel there. But then they started getting persecuted in Judea, so they scattered out into Samaria, which is that was the capital of the 10 northern tribes, if you remember that. They're preaching the gospel there, and then they get persecuted there. Then Paul and his, his followers and his disciples, they're going to the uttermost parts of the world, and that's how you and I, and the people in Kenya, and the people in Australia, and the people in India, and people in wherever, are believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen! Amen! So, the, the dichotomy here, 
Take a look at this again. Many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And then compare that with, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. So you're gonna have, there's going to be a war. There's going to be a war. The false prophets preaching their nonsense, their false gospel, and the people of God preaching the true gospel. And he said they're going to preach it all over the world. Now, I don't know how that's all going to take place. But I guarantee you, it won't be on the internet won't be on television. I, I just, I don't know. I just don't believe that. I believe that the gospel is going to be preached from a person to a person or a group of people. That's sort of what I believe, but that's just my imagination. Don't know how it's going to take place. But the interesting thing about these verses is the clash between the two. This is the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. There is nothing wrong with this book. But they've got something else that they preach to everybody. Okay? Um, and because iniquity shall abound, he said, the love of many shall wax cold. What's happening with people right now? People are getting caught up in sins everywhere. Church people, pastors, deacons, Sunday school teachers, the churches are full of iniquity. This world is full of... I mean, think about all the politicians getting caught, all of the heads of these big companies having to step down because they got into sleaziness. The CNN commentator who recently was, he worked for a company and they all had a Zoom, you know, which is, you know, the, the way companies now are having meetings, they're doing it on the computer. Only this guy was engaged in something he didn't know that he was on camera and all of his business partners are watching him engaged in personal, you get what I'm saying. He did that on camera live in front of all those people, didn't know that the camera was on. People are getting caught up everywhere and because because of the sin that rises up in them, it causes their natural love for fellow man. Jesus said that's going to wax cold. In other words, it's going to be non-existent. They're going to be like beasts. Okay? He that in, shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now, this verse is controversial, especially those who believe in the dispensationalism. They point to this verse and they say, that's not for us because we don't have to endure. Really? Even though the New Testament and Paul's doctrine always says, if we endure to the end, if we continue in the faith, and we're not talking about endurance and works. We're talking about remaining faithful. Do we still believe no matter what happens to us, Will we still believe what Jesus said and hold to those promises? And I'm, I'm going to tell you this, that, that right there is going to separate the real Christians from the phony ones. The phony ones are going to drop out they're, because they're going to say, well, I didn't, you know, I, yeah, I'm seeing what's going on in the world. I didn't believe that to begin with. I never believed that. They're going to say that about this book. You watch and see. All right. So. When Jesus talked about these false prophets, we have a, and number one, there are a lot of places in the Bible that show us the identity of false prophets, how to recognize them, how to know you're being lied to, how to know when a false prophet comes and he makes a claim like I'm an apostle or I'm a prophet and I, you know, I saw a dream and it's, the, you know, I'm going to tell you this dream and or, I, or I'm going to show you signs and wonders or all kind or I talked to an angel, an angel talked to me or Jesus talked to me. I'm going to show you something that blow your mind. Okay, you get ready for this. We have an example in the Bible of the False prophet. The ultimate of all false prophets, if there has always been false prophets on the earth, all of them together would equal this one false prophet. 
Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. You remember in Paul, or excuse me, Peter, Peter and, and um, um, Jude wrote similar things about false prophets. And Peter talked about these false prophets like beasts made to be taken and destroyed. That these false prophets have a beast nature to them, which means that they can't change their nature. They were created by God to do what they are doing. I'll show you that. But I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. And notice this, he spake as a dragon. The dragon is, of course, Satan, the beast. And it's the, he, he speaks the opposite of what this Bible speaks. All right? That's all you got to do is know this Bible. And then when you hear the false prophets, you go, well, that's the exact opposite of what I heard in the scriptures. Study, people. Study. Verse 12, and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed, and he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and he and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. Now, if there is a sign of a religion that you know is against the true gospel of Jesus Christ, it would be a religion with an image. Some kind of image, something that they bow towards, something that they look at, gaze at, wonder at, pray to, pray before. That religion is wrong. I mentioned this story about being at a Lutheran, and I'm not saying all Lutherans are evil, bad, but this one, I couldn't, I could not reconcile it. I go inside this church. It's a family that I knew. They were always active in Missouri, Christian politics, things like that. Their son was killed in an auto accident. And so I went to the funeral and I'm looking up on the stage and there's this big statue of Jesus up there. And I'm just going, uh, you're not supposed to do that. And then the priest of the church comes in, the Lutheran minister comes down the aisle and he's walking down the aisle and he's reading a prayer. And I'm going, well, reading prayers. I'm not, I'm not for that. Then he walks up on the stage, faces the idol, bows to it and is reading the prayer. And I'm going, okay, that's wrong. First thing out of God's mouth was, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Then, then he said, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. So the false prophet, his goal, everything that he does and all his little false prophets with him, their number one goal is to somehow press these people into believing that this image really is their God, the beast. And he's going to succeed in it. The setup, I believe, is going on right now. Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 2. Remember, the false prophet uses signs and wonders. Now, anybody can do magic tricks. I've watched magicians for years, studied how they do things. It's always that I don't know personally of a stage magician that actually does use satanic magic to perform their miracles. I don't know of one. Now, you might have seen something on the internet that just made you, he's satanic, look, he's using devils. I, I don't know that because of the way videos can be edited, videos can be manipulated. I, I just don't buy that stuff, okay? I don't, remember, we walk by faith and not by sight. How, having said that, we know that their power, their satanic power, we're talking about the false prophets, is going to increase. 
And I do believe that they will declare signs and wonders, and those signs and wonders are going to come to pass. Now, here's the problem. Just because fire falls down from heaven, does that mean that that's the presence of God and he's favoring that? No. Look at what Paul said, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and what? Lying wonders. And with all deceivableness, look at the words here, lying wonders, deceivableness of unrighteousness. That means they're full of sin and they just believe stuff. Are you, are you catching what I'm throwing at you? They're full of sin. So they just believe these signs and wonders because they receive not the love of the truth. When did you read your Bible? When did you have the desire to have God's power in your life through this book? Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And I'm just sending a warning out to people. It's my job as the watchman to warn you. The storm's coming. The sword is coming. The false prophets are rising up. Do you believe them? Do you follow? Well, I only watch them every now and then because they got some good things that they say. Yeah, of course they do. They've got things that they say that seem like it's good mixed in with their lies. And you should be warned to stay away with them. Notice what Jesus said about these lying signs and wonders. John chapter four, verse 48, then said Jesus unto him, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Matthew 16, four, wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign and there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas and he left them and departed. Jesus was not interested in doing tricks for these people in order to get them to believe him. In fact, he did perform miracles. He did raise people from the dead. He healed blind people. He healed lame and deaf people. I mean, he did that all the time and people followed him. But what happened was they fell in love when he started preaching to them. They heard the words that he said, not just the signs that he gave them and the wonders and the miracles that he performed. He did that to draw them to what he said. And when he began to preach, that convinced them that this man is the son of God. It was the words that he said that converted them, not the signs and the wonders. Do you know people who are so caught up in the charismatic movement, Pentecostal stuff? Not, not all of them are lost, I'll say. But a lot of them promise signs and wonders and healings and raising people from the dead. Oh my goodness, he's the prophet of God. Look at what he did. He, look at those people. They came in wheelchairs and now they're all standing up. Really? Do you believe that one? And uh, by the way, in this series, I'm going to name names. I sure enough am. And I may name names of people that you follow online or have followed on television or whatever. But Jesus warned about the people who would who won't believe it unless there's signs and wonders. And then they'll believe it. Jesus warned about them. They're wicked and adulterous. What does that tell you about their activities outside of the big tent revival that they had? Jesus said they're adulterous. And they're seeking after not the real God, but false gods. Now, let's go back to the law. God spends a lot of time here. And there's a lot of real estate in the Bible where God deals with false prophets. How to recognize them, how to spot them, how to listen to what they say. And if they start talking about, let us go after this or let us do this, or whatever, and you know that it's contrary to the word of God, 
then you have an obligation to stand up against it. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1. God told Moses, if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, those people are all over the internet, they just irritate me, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder. And the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. That's, that's the greatest commandment. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death, because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. Now, I'm going to repeat that last part. People, put away the evil from the midst of you. Let me tell you what's going to happen with you. Your, your personal sins, whatever they are, maybe you're an adulterer, maybe you're a, a thief, maybe you're a liar, maybe you're a gossip. What, that's pride of life, gossip is. Whatever your sins are, get them, put the evil away from the midst of thee. Get it out of your life. Now, that would be impossible, but for the grace of God. God can help you remove that out of your life. But if you don't, then you're showing God that you don't love him with all your heart, all your soul, all your might. Then God will send false prophet and he'll show a little magic trick. He'll show a sign or a wonder. And you'll say, well, he's the man of God. God will turn you over to a reprobate mind. I'm pleading with you. Put away the evil from the midst of you. Let's go back and look at this first, that there rise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams. And again, the internet, YouTube is full. Facebook, full of people saying they've had visions. Now, when God first called me into studying Bible prophecy, I admit, I've admitted this before, I was looking at some of these guys who were saying that they had dreams and visions. One man sent by the Prophecy Club came to St. Louis. I went up to see him, and I took a notebook, and I very carefully wrote down almost everything he said. When he made claims about dreams and visions, I wrote them down. Then the Prophecy Club said that when he goes to a city, he's going to prophesy over that city and tell the things that are going to happen in that city. So I went up there, and I wrote them all down. He was talking about tanks in the streets and there was going to be baby stealings and there was some kind of mountain somewhere in Arizona, New Mexico, that was a dormant volcano that was going to erupt and kill a bunch of people. So he made all these prophecies. And I left that meeting and I said, God, he seems honest, but let God be true and every man a liar. So God show me from the Bible whether what this man said was true or not. Well, it's become very easy. Nothing of what he said has ever happened, ever. And that was more than 20 years ago. He talked as if they were imminent, but they never happened. People, I used to ask, because I would see these guys saying, man, I had this vision and God showed me this. And I thought they were sincere. And several times I would be praying and I would say, God, give me dreams and visions like you give those. And God would say, Mike, here are your dreams and visions. 
God did that with me about three times. And finally, I said, God, I will not ask you for this ever again. I believe you. Everything that I need to know is going to be right here in this book. Everything. If you think God left something out that he's going to tell somebody on Facebook, you, do you really think that? Okay. But anyway, a sign or a wonder, then he's going to get them with, let's go after other gods. We're going to deal with that. But notice that he said, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. God sent the false prophet. God allowed the false prophet to come your way for him to show his signs and wonders, show you his dream or his vision or whatever it is. And the sign, and he's, and he's was like saying, okay, three days from now, there's going to be a major car crash in a certain area. And he gives the area and he gives how many people are going to die. And lo and behold, it happens. God will allow that. Now, how did he know? I think devils give him or her these ideas, and then cause the wreck. They have that power. Why not? But it'll come to pass. And then you've got a choice. Am I going to follow this guy or am I going to stick with my Bible? You've got a choice. Choose the Bible. Every time we walk by faith, not by. Quit looking at the signs and the wonders. It's a setup. All right, now, let's look at how the false prophet would get people to believe in other gods. Other gods. How, how would you get the, um, just the average American housewife or working wife or working man how would you get that person who follows things on the internet? They follow like conservative right wing stuff on the internet and they've got an AR 15 and stuff like that. They've got food stored, you know, just the average person. And they say they're a Christian, but they're not. How would you get them to go after other gods? It, it actually happens easier than you think. God told Israel, Exodus 20, verse 3, thou shalt have no other gods before me. In other words, here's God, and you've got it in your mind that these other gods are the way to God. They are before God. And people pray to them to get to God. Follow what I'm saying? First Timothy 2, 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. So here you have all these devils, other gods, and people are following them, listening to them, hearing from them, obeying them, but they believe in their heart that these other gods are the mediator to God Almighty. But God said, you shall have no other gods before me. So how is it that Jesus can be the mediator between man and God if there can be no other gods before God? It's quite simple. Jesus is God. He's not of the other gods, the created gods. He's not of them. He was. He always was. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was, and the Word was God, and the Word was, well, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. In other words, the Word, Jesus Christ, was already there when everything was, cre when He created everything, and everything was created. He was already there. He is preexistent God, Jesus Christ is. That's how He can not violate that commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. He's God. And he's the only one. Listen to me. He's the only one by which we must reach God. One mediator only. Father Luke or Father David or Father John or whoever these fathers are. 
There's only one mediator, and her name is not Santa Maria. Ain't it? Take a look at this. St. Mary, St. Joseph, St. Luke, St. Mark, St. Paul, St. Peter, St. Uh, Mother Teresa, St. John Paul II. What in the world did he do to become a saint? What, what was his deal? St. Teresa, St. Anne. They worship, they worship. They not only pray to these things, they got a statue of them. So they're violating two of the commandments. God said, I'm a jealous God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. So they're violent. The very first two things that comes out of their mouth, every 1.2 billion Roman Catholics in this world violate the first two commandments by praying to lesser gods, using them, oh, St. Christopher, please go with us as we travel. Can St. Christopher do that? Can Mother Mary really go to Jesus who hates your guts? He's angry at you. So you go to Santa Maria. So because you know that Jesus will obey his mother. And I'm not, listen, I'm not making this stuff up. This is what Catholics believe. This is what they teach. This is what their fathers tell them to do. Even though it's not in the Bible. Well, I'm going to go to Mother Mary. Because she is going to go and soften the heart of Jesus and, and make him submit unto her. And there is a move. There is, and when's it going to happen? I don't know. John Paul II tried to squeeze it in and couldn't really do it. I don't know about, uh, Saint uh, po uh, Francis, the talking Pope. I don't know about him, what he, how he sees it, but at some point, they're going to stick in, and they've sort of done it. They're going to stick in Mary as co-redemptrix. They've already said that they believe that her role in our salvation was equal to Jesus' role in the salvation. Because when Jesus was on the cross, Mary's heart was feeling all of the agony and the suffering. She suffered like Jesus did on the cross, even though she's not on the cross. It's very simple. Jesus did all the suffering and it, and see, because they believe that Mary was born immaculate without sin, which is a lie. Cause when she found out she was pregnant, she called God her savior. Pretty simple, isn't it? So 1.2 billion Roman Catholics all over the world already doing so the miracle of Fatima where they say Mary appeared, the Virgin Mary appeared in the sky to these children. And the Catholic Church believes that. And then in Catholic churches all over the world, they got, they've got they got relics. In some cases, the whole decom nearly decomposed, dried up body of some nun or some monk, their skeleton in a church where people will go and bow to that and pray to that, they're full of dead men's bones, Jesus said in Matthew 23. They are whited sepulchers full of dead men's bones. And they follow other gods. Now, here's, here's what the Catholic Church says, why they believe what they believe. The historic Christian practice of asking our departed brothers and sisters in Christ, the saints... For their intercession has come under attack in the last few hundred years. You better believe it, buddy. The practice dates to the earliest days of Christianity and is shared by Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, and other Eastern Christians, and even some Anglicans. So stop right here. 1.2 billion Roman Catholics. I don't know how many um, Eastern Orthodox there are, but that's all Turkey and going into Russia. They believe it. They practice it. Other Eastern Christians, some Anglicans, they believe it. They bow and pray to the saints. Um, it still comes under heavy attack from many within the Protestant movement that started in the 16th century. Excuse me, Papa. The Protestant movement, the real Christians, 
They didn't just show up in the 16th century. They've always been there. You just tried to eradicate them and kill them. They've always been there, and they've always stood against your Roman popery. Amen. Now, can saints hear us? One charge made against it is that the saints in heaven cannot even hear our prayers, making it useless to ask for their intercession. But as scripture indicates, those in heaven are aware of the prayers of those on earth. This can be seen, for example, in Revelation 5, 8, where John depicts the saints in heaven offering our prayers to God under the form of golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. But if the saints in heaven are offering our prayers to God, then they must be aware of our prayers. You see the sleight of hand that he used in here and how he twisted the scriptures? So he said, well, it seems like if they can do this, then they can do that. And I've read a lot of arguments from Catholic priests and things like, and this is how they do it. Well, if Mary is Jesus' mother, and we know that people ought to obey their mother and honor their mother, you see what they did? They went from Scripture to man's wisdom. And it just stands to reason that if, if Mary is Jesus' mother and Jesus would honor his mother, then it stands to reason that if we prayed to Mary, that Mary then would give our prayers to Jesus and Jesus would be comforted and say, okay, mom, I'll do what you say. That's how they twist it. That's how they do it. They give man's wisdom to twist the scriptures. There is nothing in Revelation 5. five. Let's... Let's turn there. Text without context is pretext. So Revelation chapter 5, verse, let's go to verse 6. Now this is the picture where Jesus is going to take the book and open it. And I beheld it lo in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts in the midst of the, uh, the, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song. All they're doing is holding it. That's all they're doing. Nothing in here, nothing in here, in anything Paul said, in anything that Jesus said, tells us to pray to these saints. Nothing. Not one word. They're lying through their teeth. Oh, here's another one. This gets us into the people who follow the New Age movement these other gods that they get in contact with, they call them by many names, the ascended masters, uh, the enlightened ones, and they believe that Jesus was one of these, that Jesus was the same as Buddha. Fire me up. And so what they do is they empty their mind, go into a trance, connect in the waves. They get, they get, they, they must raise their frequency in order to get in touch with the people uh, of the ascended masters and their frequency. And when their frequencies connect together, then the ascended masters enter into the body of the people. You see the, you see the, um, sort of the fake Holy Spirit thing going on when you're saved. Jesus, literally the Holy Spirit of God, the spirit of Christ enters into us and fills us, and fills us with the Word of God. And we can't get enough of it. We just read it, we love it, we meditate on it, we study these things. Okay? It's our life. And it's simple. We don't have to get into God's frequency. And there are websites out there that will tell you that. That the only way to tune in really with God and get the real stuff from God, not all this stuff in the world like the Bible and all that stuff, but when you tune into God's frequency and 
then you can start getting things from God that nobody else gets. But they're not tuning into God. They're not, because God made it simple for us to just ask Jesus, one mediator. We have the Spirit of God in us. It didn't change our voice, so we go, I, I am the Ascended Master. I've seen people do that. Okay, Now, I don't know if they're really being indwelt with some devil, or they're just putting on a show. Who knows? But these people, certainly these Ascended Masters, have used people to write a lot of books. That I can tell you. Here's another one. Hinduism. Let, let, let me show you a verse here. Revelation 12, verse 3. There appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Notice that the tail of the dragon took one-third of the angels of heaven, cast them down to the earth. What is one-third as a percentage? 33.33333. It's an infinite thing. I've, I've said this before. I love this. God is so, God is so smart. He knows how to take from an innumerable amount of angels and cut off exactly one third of them. Even though one third has a decimal that keeps going and going and going and going and going and never stops. God knows how to cut off one third of an innumerable company of angels. So 33% of and that's, there's going to be a lot of them, right? So go back to the Hindus. How many gods did they have? 330 million. Do you think that maybe that number, 33.3333, sort of leaked down into the people who believe in Hinduism? So they claim that they believe in 330 million gods. That's a lot of gods to say, I'm sorry to, to ask forgiveness from. I don't think you can do that in a lifetime, ask all these gods to forgive you. Now, they have main gods like Shiva, and Brahma. We won't get into those, but they are part of the overall heavenly realm, I guess, of Hinduism. 330 million gods are the one-third of all the false devil angels that Satan at some point is going to cast down to this earth. So we, we have this thing going on here. Back in with the ascended masters, the new age believes that these ascended masters are going to come down to the earth. Hinduism. Okay. It believing in the one third of the angels who are going to fall and be cast down to the earth. Okay? Then you have the UFO movement, which is connected to the New Age movement. Because you have Stephen Greer uh, doing CE5, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, where instead of humans, you know, driving their car at night and all of a sudden seeing a UFO fly through the sky, instead of that, they're actually calling them down. Come down to us. And they, they go into a meditative trance. Now think about this. It's the only way they can. They go into a meditative trance, like the New Agers, like the people in the churches where they're doing um, Ignatian contemplation or they're doing contemplative prayer where you empty your mind, you create a space so God can fill it because God, you know, does he can't squeeze into all that clutter we have in our brain. So we must empty our mind and open the door so God can come in. That's a lie, people. It's a lie. But that's exactly what they're doing. Why is it that this sophisticated alien races 
flying in these ships can only be contacted by people who raise their consciousness. Why is that? Why can't they just show up and say, hi, how you doing? You have the, we talked about this, the Greys and the Draconians and the, you know, the tall whites, the Nordics. And what's going to happen? What does Stephen Greer want? What does um, Freemason Tom DeLong want with To The Stars Academy? What do all these UFO groups want? I can tell you, I've studied them. They all want one thing. What did Colonel uh, Philip Corso want when he released the book the day after Roswell and he released the information about he had alien technology that they developed into working things? What, did, what was it that he said he wanted to do? He said, give this to the younger generation. Let them have it. He wanted, he felt like this technology was good for mankind. So let's benefit mankind with these other gods that will come. They are going to come down one of these days when man's consciousness has been raised. You know what I believe that is? I believe that second Thessalonians 2 11 for God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And I want you to notice something to the UFO people. All of these devils look like UFO people to the Hindus. All of these devils look like just various gods like the monkey god and Ganesha, the elephant-headed god. They look like things that they have in their imagination. To the uh, New Age people, these ascended masters all sort of look human-like. To the 1.2 billion Roman Catholics plus the Eastern Orthodox plus some of the Anglicans, they believe that these gods were people on this earth who ascended up on high and now they're gods and now they can hear our prayer and do and go to God and say, God, Mike Hoggard wants this or whatever. No, I've never prayed to them. Notice that they look all different to all the different people, but they all want them to come down here. All of them do. They want at least one of them. I know the Hindus, they want at least one of those gods to come down here, find an avatar to dwell in, and rule and reign over the earth. All of them want that, even though they have different images in their mind of what they look like. They all want them to come down here. So going back to Deuteronomy 13, it seems like God is telling us that, yes, there's going to be a false prophet, a dreamer of dreams. He's going to give a sign or a wonder. And then he's going to say, let us worship these other gods. And everybody's going to fall for it. That, I believe, is the strong delusion that Paul mentioned, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11. Because God certainly is going to send them down here. Because they didn't love the word of God, because they didn't love the truth, God is going to turn them over. He's going to send them a strong delusion. And people, you think that you're going to escape because you study and research things on the internet and you're not going to be fooled by it. But I'm telling you, if you're lost and you're deep in sin, which we know you are, if you're that way, all the knowledge that you pick up off the internet is not going to save you. And it just seems like God sort of has me on a mission to plead with you who follow this ministry, or you just happen to hear this particular video, to plead with you to start studying this book. Learn it. Know it. Know what it says. Follow the simplicity of it. Some things, yeah, you're not going to understand. I don't understand. I can't, I can't, I don't know everything that's in this Bible. I can't know that. 
okay? But God will give you enough of the truth. And when the lie is told, you'll say, I know that's a lie. Or you'll say, well, looks like the Bible was wrong. One of the, one of the two is what's going to happen with you. And my hope and my prayer has always been that God would do with you what by his mercy he did with me. He drew me out of the deep pit that I was in, pulled me out, washed me clean, took a rod after me, changed me, made me a different person, and then caused me to know that this Bible is right in everything it says. Next week, we're going to start learning about who these false prophets are. And I want to say this to those of you in Kenya who hear me on uh, Watchman FM or Eka Yokan Radio. I want you to be looking for next the next Watchman broadcast because I'm going to go against Dr. David Owar. He is a false prophet a reprobate, sleazy man, evil man, a man who thinks that he is God. And some of you say, oh, that's a lie. That Pastor Mike is lying through his teeth. I'll show it to you. I will show it to you. Because he says that he's the prophet that Moses prophesied of that would come to his people. Excuse me, that prophet is Jesus Christ. And Dr. Owar put himself in the place of Jesus. Therefore, he thinks he's God. And that's a lie. And I don't want you to believe a lie. I don't want you to believe guys like him. Because all he's going to do in the end is hurt you. You're going to be deceived. You're going to find out one of these days that he is not who he said he was. And it's going to hurt you. And I want to spare you from believing him. What, what, did, what does the Bible say? Let God be true. And every man a liar. So don't you think it's better that instead of listening to Dr. David O'War, that you just read the Bible. Amen? This is Pastor Mike. I, I, you're the reason why I do what I do. Even just coming out of COVID, I've been in a fog. My body is still weak. But my heart's desire is to try to fight off Satan and help you do it by getting into the Word of God. So you are the reason why I do what I do. God bless you. Get ready. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.